Well, welcome, everyone. It's, it's good to see so many people and uh, people continuing to come in. We're now over 100 people uh, who have signed in, and there's some of us that are doubling and tripling at a screen, so there's more than that. And it's important that we be together on um, a day when I don't have to recite, recite the horrors and the challenges uh, that we face. They're here, they're real. And I do know that it's only through community that we'll be able to work through this and make the transformations to a nonviolent future. And we can, we can do that. I also am aware that we won't get there by just using the same means that have created the problem, that we have to look to other approaches. And that's what we're going to be talking about today in terms of mindfulness uh, as a, an approach that has impacted nonviolent peace force and also uh, hopefully will continue to spread and impact all of us. And today I'm, I'm really excited that we have uh, with us Jack Cornfield, who many of you know, who uh, is a Bru uh, Buddhist practitioner. He's a founder uh, of Spirit Rock Meditation Center, has written many books. And I think two things are most important. One, he's been one of the ushers of mindfulness to the, to the West. And that's been an important introduction. And secondly, a honor I share with him is that he's a grandfather. So we'll be hearing from Jack in a, a few minutes. And also at the end, he will be leading us in a 15 minute meditation. And then we have also with us, Rosemary Kabaki, uh, who is in Nairobi tonight and uh, is been one of our, um, really is one of the leading people in knowing how to do field operations of unarmed civilian protection in the world. If I, if I were to name two or three, Rosemary would be on that list. She has uh, worked in some very challenging areas, including uh, this, the country of Georgia, Mindanao in the Philippines and is currently our head of mission in um, Myanmar. She also helped us establish the uh, program a year and a half ago in the United States. So welcome, Rosemary. So for those of you uh, who don't know me, my name is Mel Duncan and I'm credited along with David Hartso, who was here with us uh, as being one of the co-founders of Nonviolent Peace Force. Uh, David and I agreed a long time ago that that's a little bit of an overstatement. We're much more, uh, what we did was to hold the focus, hold the focus on an idea that was ready to emerge and hold the focus until a lot of people could join the circle and create and co-create Nonviolent Peace Force. In 1997, I went on a year and a half spiritual sojourn that led me to places I never imagined. I started out at a place called the University of Creation Spirituality in downtown Oakland, California. And there I was challenged to my core about the way that I organized for peace and social justice, which was always us versus them, right versus wrong, good versus evil. And I was challenged to start understanding our work, my work, indeed my life, from a point of unity. And that led me in places I had never imagined when I had left Minnesota. Everywhere I turned, people were saying to me, have you heard about Thich Nhat Hanh? And I, I, the school was such that I could read everything that he had written and I was able to take part in a, a Buddhist Sangha in the Bay Area. And a, about a year and a half later, I was in Plum Village, his monastery in Southern France, uh, 
it, having an experience that I knew within a moment was way, way over my head and would challenge me again to my core. And one of the things, uh, one of the messages, and by this time it was 1998, uh, that Thich Nhat Hanh was, was saying that we're no longer at the place where we can afford to take sides. The stakes are too high for all sentient beings and that we have to understand our, our unity, not to uh, uh, ignore the conflicts, but to come at those conflicts from an understanding of unity. And I, for those of you who know me, I, it was 12 hours of silence every day, uh, which uh, was excruciatingly hard. Um, and it was on leaving Plum Village in late October of 1998, I was riding on a bus in Southern France and had my ever-present notebook and wrote down the vision for Nonviolent Peace Force. And I can truly say that without that inspiration and provocation at both the University of Creation Spirituality and then from Thich Nhat Hanh and others at Plum Village that I would not be here today. And so I, um, really uh, hold him in, in high esteem and still take part in a, a Sangha uh, three days a week that's based on uh, his mindfulness training. So now I, I'd like to uh, reintroduce Jack. Uh, Jack uh, it has been a longtime supporter of Nonviolent Peace Force. And if you'd share some of your insights on mindfulness and on the connection of peace building and peacekeeping. Thank you, Mel. Um, it's really an honor to speak to you. <clears throat> and I say that, you know, people start and say, oh, it's an honor to speak to you. This is really an honor. The work that you do and the, the beauty and the vision that you carry in some of the most difficult places in the world just so touches my heart. And what happened to you, Mel, um, also happened to Christina Figuera, who you might know. She is a diplomat from Costa Rica, who was the UN Special Representative for Climate Change that arranged Rio and yes. then yes. the Paris Climate Accord. And she was in despair before the cli climate conference in Paris. She couldn't, she said, I just, everybody's fighting and I don't know how to do this and I, I might have to quit. And somebody said, well, there's this this place in the south of France, she'd never heard of it with this funny Vietnamese monk, Plum Village. And she went there and, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh is, was a little bit like a neutron star. You get near him and the trajectory of your life changed. And she said, I went in seeing victims and perpetrators and I left seeing us. I left seeing us as family and I pulled together 196 countries based on that. So. Um, it, that's the same kind of spirit to commend to you. And I come to you, um, dear, you know, what you do is so dear to my heart. Uh, I began, you know, as an activist in the 1960s and I worked in the Philippines and I was a monk in Burma and uh, across Southeast Asia. And I did some work in Cambodia and both peace work and monastic training. Um, and the major part of what you do of what Nonviolent Peace Force does of unarmed civilian protection requires one other thing that you all know. And what I'm gonna say is things that are not new to you, that the greatest protection is your own heart, that nothing else will carry you through those circumstances. And I can hear from you and Mel and Webert and Tiffany and others, I just bow to the fact that um, you already know what it means to do a mindfulness practice and center yourself and, um, and be, that be the peace that you want to have happen. Because I've seen too many angry or burned out activists, as you said, Mel, we don't even have to say much more about it. And here we are in the middle of climate change and you know all the migration from the from climate change and the population pressures and the 
continuing racism and you know violence and so forth and your ability to see everyone as a victim is probably the key insight to realize that actually we're we're all in this together and i remember bringing the dalai lama together with a number of people who had just gotten out of long years in prison who'd been doing transformative mindfulness practice and he brought with these old grizzled guys coming out of 29 years in a Texas prison or 18 years in Oregon State, these two young nuns. He said, well, I want them to speak. And they had been uh, arrested, tortured, electric prods, all kinds of terrible things um, for reciting their prayers in public. Um, and he said, so tell them what, what you did. And they said, well, we were there and it was so terrible. What else could we do? We looked around and we saw the suffering that was being made and we prayed for the enemy. We spent our days there offering prayers for their hearts and their well-being. Um, and these old guys and a few women coming out of prison said, hey, I've seen, I've seen brave. I've never seen anything like these young girls. And I might say that of nonviolent peace force in some profound way. To see that we're in it together um, is the only way the world will change. So mindfulness, I'd like to rename for our conversation as loving awareness. It's a combination of presence and heart at the same time. And the original teachings, at least in the Buddhist tradition where much of this has been developed is that mindfulness must be cultivated in both an inner and an outer way. The whole notion that spiritual practice is somehow <clears throat> individual <coughs> is, uh, is um, completely misguided. The spiritual practice actually, or mindfulness practice, is in fact an invitation to dissolve that sense of separateness and realize viscerally the connection with every breath that you interbreathe with the trees and the beings around you who are breathing the same breath and drinking the same water that goes through your body that you drink and urinate and then it goes out and somebody else drinks it. This is how it works in human incarnation. And so the inner and the outer, and what that means is that we can bring them to the same, same circumstance. And my beloved, my wife, Trudy, spent some time working in the Darfur camps on the border of Darfur and um, Chad. And she's an early childhood expert among many things, a mindfulness teacher. And she worked with all these young women doing stuff for this beautiful anti-genocide group called IACT, does amazing stuff. Um, and at the end, she asked all these young women who she was training as teachers, she gave them education skills and you know, conflict skills and things like that. What was their favorite thing? And they said, oh, mindfulness. She was surprised and she said, why? And they said, well, our past has so much terror and trauma in it. You all know the burning of villages, the killing of so many family members, the escape. And our future is so uncertain. And you taught us how to be where we are and to trust that we could stay in the present and make something good for the future. So it's actually quite revolutionary. And at the same time, anybody with eyes can see that there's no technological fix, that no amount of computers and artificial intelligence and biotechnology and nanotechnology and space technology is gonna stop continuing warfare, continuing racism, continuing climate disruption, that the remarkable outer developments of humanity have to now be matched by the development of the human heart and human character. As the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff some years ago said, we are a nation of nuclear giants and ethical infants. And so, Nonviolent Peace Force has been founded, as Mel said, and has to be on this vision of understanding that the inner and outer cannot be separated. And 
you know, my experience, one of my closest teachers and colleagues and friends was Mahabhusananda, the Gandhi of Cambodia. Um, and when he was uh, asked to speak in the US Congress, about the ban on landmines worldwide, which was one of the campaigns he was part of that eventually got the Nobel, it got the Nobel Prize. He went and he had so much humility and, and he spoke so beautifully with love. And he said, you know, you really wanna make a difference. And it's not the landmines that are the real problem. He said, it's the landmines in the heart. And then he paused and he said, we need to look into our own hearts to see the dangers, the, the, the ways that we see other beings that lead to these kinds of conflicts. And of course he was remarkable. Um, and I worked with him in refugee camps for a bit. I remember, you know, in one of the camps of a hundred thousand people on the Thai Cambodian border, he and I had been in a forest monastery together and he went up and asked the UNHCR to make a little temple, just a platform with a Buddha on it to bring some spirit back to these people. And then they called people and we did with a big gong and the Khmer Rouge underground said, if anyone goes to this temple, when you get back into Cambodia, you, you will be killed. So we didn't know if anyone would come, but we rang the temple bell around the camp and 25,000 people poured into the central square anyway. And I thought, well, what can he say? He's looking out to the faces that you who are on the ground and you know, the various countries in the Philippines and Myanmar and so forth, you know the faces of trauma where family members have been killed and everything's been lost and there's one grandmother in the, two remaining grandchildren, what can he say? And he put his hands together. All 19 members of his family were killed. His temple was burned, his village destroyed. He looked at those faces and he began to chant in Cambodian and in Sanskrit Pali, hatred never ceases by hatred, but by love alone is healed. This is the ancient and eternal law and it's one of the first verses of the Buddhist text. And he chanted it over and over. And pretty soon everybody started to chant with him with tears running down their cheeks because they hadn't heard these chants for some years. And I realized that he spoke a truth that was even bigger than their suffering. That he said, no matter what we have been through, it wasn't you, but we have been through, hatred never ceases by hatred but by love alone is healed. And then he led these peace walks through the killing fields for 15 years, bringing people back to their villages, doing that chant. And the poet Hafez says, fear is the cheapest room in the house. I'd like to see you in better living conditions. What he showed is that the spirit of the heart can't be um, taken from you. They can take everything. Everything can be taken, but not your spirit. And I watched it when monks from another forest monastery, when there was all this conflict in the center of Bangkok between the government and the military and the students and barricades and people getting shot. And it was escalating, it was getting worse and worse. And one morning, an abbot led a whole group of forest monks and nuns on foot through the dark to stand between the lines in the middle of that. Um, and there was such reverence at that time. And there was the military and there were the, there were the students and there were the guns and the Molotov cocktails. And for eight hours, the monks and nuns just stood there peacefully and didn't say a word. And then they walked away. And that began the moment of the, that the dialogue was possible between the two sides and things began to open up. But to do this, the last thing I say is, just as you need to train the outer, you need to train the inner. You need to actually be able to sit and feel your restlessness and your heartbreak and your pain. And with mindfulness, you become the loving awareness and say, oh yes, um, thank you for trying to protect me to your 
worried thoughts. I'm okay just now. Oh, this pain is terrible. Let me feel how big it is and you invite it to open. Oh, you know, restlessness, itching. I was with somebody who was dying recently who'd been meditating. She said, I'm so grateful for sitting with the pain and the fear and the stories and the itches that I didn't scratch and staying with it because it taught me how to be present for the joys and the sorrows of life and rest in loving awareness itself. So this is the training that's an absolute necessity and a compliment that allows us to go into these difficult situations and keep a steady and peaceful heart. As Thich Nhat Hanh said, when the crowded Vietnamese refugee boats met with storms or pirates, if everyone panicked, all would be lost. But if even one person remained centered and calm on the boat, that was enough. They showed the way for everyone to survive. And this is as much of the power that we carry, the power of the heart that's needed to transform this world. And you learn it in your own inner training. And you learn it by sitting with the pains and the hopes and the fears and the depression and the anger and all of that, that it's not a stranger to you. And all of that is welcome in the field of loving awareness, coming and going, acknowledged and bowed to yes, yes, you too, your voice is included in the compassionate and loving heart. So I think my time is just about up. Um, I really want to encourage you to find your ways. If anyone hasn't trained in this way, there's all kinds of beautiful trainings online and I can make available to Nonviolent Peace Force and followers a free program on training in mindfulness. Um, but I just want to stop with a breath and acknowledge the, the courage and the interest. <sighs> ground ourselves on this beautiful earth, breathe together and say, yes, we know how to, born in you is the great heart of compassion. We actually have the capacity to hold all of these, all of the suffering, and then to plant seeds, to be as the Dalai Lama said, a bridge, a boat, a raft across the flood. May I be medicine for the sick and a resting place for the weary. May I be food for the hungry and a lamp in the darkness. And may I offer myself from this spirit of our interconnection as a bodhisattva. May I offer myself wherever I go um, as a beacon of peace, as a healer of misery, a messenger of wonder. So gratitude to all the work you do and encouragement to continue the inner as well as the outer. Thank you, Jack. I note that uh, my friend Adam has uh, posted a question in the chat. Uh, and I invite anyone who has a question to put it in uh, the chat box. And we will be gathering up those questions and uh, be responding to them uh, after we hear from Rosemary. And then after that, Jack will lead us in a 15 minute meditation uh, after the, the uh, talking part of the program uh, closes. So now uh, Rosemary is with us, which is always uh, something that I cherish when I can say that. Uh, Rosemary, would you please tell us about your experience with mindfulness in being in some of the most violent places on our planet. Um, first of all, um, just I must say thanks to Jack actually for bringing us to where we're really well connected with our inner selves. Uh, just by the last few minutes of his presentation, that, that was really amazing. Um, I. I would like to talk about um, not 
not from us studying and Jack, I'll take you up on all these places that we could study about mindfulness uh, because I haven't yet taken that step to do it. Um, I joined Nonviolent Peace Force because I wanted to find a, something to do just as a regular human being uh, without necessarily a lot of training um, and just believing in the principles uh, of unarmed civilian protection, um, nonviolence, nonpartisanship, and the primacy of local actors. And what I have found across the world in the many places Nonviolent Peace Force has taken me is that it is people who make these principles happen, that each individual that works with us works with us believing in nonviolence, wanting to discuss about nonviolence, whether they have challenges in, in how to interpret what nonviolence is and nonviolence for themselves and for others, that they themselves, how, what do they understand to be nonviolence and what do, does that mean for their communities? What does that mean for them in their family? And that, as a person who's worked for Nonviolent Peace Force um, has put me in relatively interesting um, opportunities to have these conversations. And first of all, I then found out that I myself have to, can I say buy into it? Not only talk about it, but constantly and continuously reassess in different scenarios how these principles are being challenged by different uh, atrocities sometimes, by different actors that I meet. When uh, I think Mel and uh, Jack, we talked about finding space uh, for the so-called enemy um, and finding that the enemy is not a static character that I may think that I am being very nonpartisan and very open and not judgmental in an issue. And behind my own back, unknown to me in my own blind spot, that I can actually find myself where I am being critical, where I am judging and criticizing and feeling like I know better and that I can make decisions on this. It's a constant battle. I'm not saying I win this battle, <laughs> it's continuously. So for example, um, um, I, when I went to Georgia, I found that uh, I had read a lot of Ken Follett books. Um, Any one of you who remembers that writer? And I was very clear, uh, uh, who, who, who stands where in the Cold War and where I stood in and where I thought was right and what, was, what should be happening. And I found myself uh, going walking in Goki Park, for example, and trying to reassess the history that I had ever learned, uh, seeing it from the eyes of the people that I was with at that time. Um, and we did some training for some youth uh, in Georgia and having trained them on unarmed civilian protection, uh, we then asked them to very in a very difficult partnership to go and meet their counterparts in Russia who also had been trained in unarmed civilian protection in, and have a conversation about their lives and the empathy and the impact the conflict has had on each of them, the same conflict coming from different perspectives. I found that I needed to be open beyond what I had thought openness meant. It is very easy to uh, talk about principles for others. It is much harder when your own principles, when the principles challenge yourself. As somebody who's worked with the Nonviolent Peace Force for a, for a while now in peacekeeping, peacemaking, um, I, I would say that it is not peace, 
is cannot be made by one person, one organization. And therefore it is very important for us to build a spiral of people like-minded, like thinking, who also query and question. And right now, uh, when we are working in Myanmar with a team, finding those how those lights, those people, those incidences where people are still believing in nonviolence, where people are still feeling that nonviolence has a role to play to reduce the violence that is going on in Myanmar. That's right now when there's so much narrative about violence in, in and of itself is the solution that we have the same principles in agreement. In terms of mindfulness, it is a personal, personal act uh, that we continue to do continuously and support each other. I find that in this work that we do, it is not only that we work towards moving forward towards innovation, inclusion, making sure that all voices are being heard, but not coming from a place of power of opening up for these voices to be heard, but actually stepping back when necessary, actually bringing up the capacity of people so that their voices can be heard. It is an active thing, the whole process of mindfulness. It is not that you think well of people, but you help what your principles are and what you believe in that you do something about it that you actually create opportunities for those people to have a voice in that particular time oh thank you rosemary uh, please put your questions in the chat and we will uh, be getting to them uh, Adam Carrolls, uh, who's uh, I know has worked for a long time. I've, I've seen him and uh, at the UN and other places working for the Burma Task Force, has a question really for Rosemary, but I would open it up to uh, Jack as well. And that's from a place of unity, working for a place, how has that been effective in the short term as well as the long term? Working in, a, in Myanmar or Burma, uh, where there has been a military coup, where some of the violence is being led by Buddhist monks. Uh, and how do we address that ongoing brutality uh, that is escalating right now in Myanmar and that we saw a, a genocide carried out against the Rohingya people? Um, and so, how do we address those needs both from the short and the long term, uh, serving both with our head and with our heart? So, uh, Rosemary, do you want to start with that? Or Jack, either of you, please? Uh, Jack, do you want to go first? Rosemary, please. You first. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, I would say that this, this kind of conversation we are having today is so important. And one of the things um, we are trying to do as a team is actually have this conversation with Myanmar nationals. Because there is an assumption that, um, especially everybody who's been following with Myanmar, they has uh, following the coup of last year, there was a lot of nonviolent uh, action uh, in protest of the coup uh, immediately after that. Um, I must say, from a personal perspective, my main concern is seeing that non that nonviolent action uh, quickly transforming in various ways into violent response. Um, I do remember uh, when I first started, um, when I got training on, on an armed civilian protection. And one of the things one of the trainers said um, was that there is an impatience with nonviolence uh, that we tend not to see when with violent action. 
So a, kind of a community may be having armed conflict for 10 or 15 years. Um, and people will keep on purchasing more arms, moving forward with those arms um, another five or 10 years. But I remember the comment that when we start working nonviolent action or unarmed methodology within six months, within one year, maybe within a two years, there is an impatience and an expectation that the results should be very immediate that we do become sometimes culturalized, I think, to believe that nonviolent action should show the results much faster and we do pay more attention to violent action. So in terms of working from a place of unity, may I say, uh, and I really, uh, Adam, thank you for saying this, we, we are losing that space of unity in a situation like Myanmar, where there is much more division that keeps on occurring. And that actually, oddly enough, gives us a starting point as nonviolent peace force to hold that unity together, to actually stop the process of breakdown of be between inter-ethnic, between people coming out from different states in Myanmar. Because only when people are joined together, working towards the same vision, do, would we start seeing a place where we are moving forward? I would also like to say that um, maybe I comment about um, uh, the, the atrocities of um, that the government in Myanmar has been accused of in regards to the Rohingya um, and, and say that this is what was amazing to a lot of Myanmar people that I've heard from our partners was to see how during this after the coup, was to see how those divisions that are inter-ethnic were actually brought together during that movement, that Rohingyas joined in, LGBTQ joined in, people with different ethnic groups joined in, all of them to have a common vision. And how to use this commonality towards peace is something that nonviolent peace force would really is really working to see how we could support that process that has already started. So every that's kind of both sides of the coin. As things fall apart, sometimes it also creates opportunity for us to start looking at how can we hold it together long enough. Um, I think Mel Duncan talked about holding vision. Yeah, hold it together long enough for us to map out ways forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Just to add a, a little bit, um, I find it heartbreaking to watch the, the Buddhist monks participate in the encouragement of violence. And yet we know because we're human beings that religion has been misused all around the world. The religion, Christ may say, turn the other cheek. And then there are things that are done that are very much the opposite. And even in Burma, which has this beautiful history, um, it's as if there's something in the brainstem in the most primitive place of tribal you know, separation. I think it was E.O. Wilson who said, we have um, primitive emotions, medieval institutions and godlike powers. And this is our problem, <laughs> that that can be triggered, the fear of the other. The, um, and it has happened in Burma and then, people hold on to it and say, this is the way that I will become powerful or famous or whatever it, whatever it is. But the thing that's important, and I, I spent some time in Ver Burma, both visiting monasteries and monks, some of those who were leading that violence um, and then others and reminding them of their nobility, which is central to the Buddhist teaching, reminding them of the legacy that they carry uh, as, a, as a community, as a nation, whether they're Buddhists or not, which is the legacy of uh, dignity and um, care, compassion for one another, and that this is really who they are over, you know, centuries and centuries, and it can get lost, but it's there in their hearts. And somehow as we carry in the nonviolent work, um, also the vision of what's possible, not only coming together, but ennobling of people, that feels like one of the best things that we can do. 
And I, I might add to that, that one of the archetypes of nonviolent uh, peacekeeping comes from the area of, of Burma, uh, Lokonat. Uh, also, uh, more specifically, Adam, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate, um, Jose Ramos Horta from Timor-Leste, uh, has been speaking about that uh, unarmed civilian protection, a uh, group uh, might be a way forward in uh, uh, Myanmar in terms of something that uh, both the UN and the regional organization, uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, uh, could support and could be a face-saving measure for the junta, uh, for well-trained unarmed civilians uh, to be there on a nonpartisan basis for civilian protection and violence prevention. So that's a, a area that we want to pursue and, and see if we can do that. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh introduced uh, applied, uh, applied Buddhism and I can see that we're uh, asked to apply it in the questions that we're getting. And so the next question is, how could we nonviolently avoid war in Ukraine? Who are you asking that question to, Mel? Uh, to either Rosemary or Jack first. Well, just as a little aside, the, the, the Buddhist participation in nonviolence goes back to the original teachings. And there were several times when the Buddha sat between warring armies that were approaching one another peacefully to try to get them to stop. Um, with his own kind of inner intervention of a peaceful part, sometimes he succeeded and sometimes he didn't. And that's the important point as well, not just that we may sometimes succeed, but that we also sow the seeds that people have that imagination and possibility that there could be another way. And so, you know, the U.S. is a warlike nation. Um, Many other nations fit that same profile, <laughs> but we are. And you can feel the, the, the savoring of war and the drums of war, certainly within, uh, within the US. And it feels like it, fuel, it fuels what's happening around Ukraine and the conflict with Russia. So I think one of the most important things that we can start to do is to lower the temperature, if you will, um, by within our, not only within our own hearts, but within our own culture and our own country here, those of us who are in the, in the US or in parts of Europe um, and say, we don't have to go this route. There is other ways for human beings to resolve conflicts and difficulties. Rosemary, do you wanna check in on that yeah, question? Just, just a quick addition, really. The more and more, the more often I move to different countries, uh, war-torn countries, the more I see that war seems to be, no matter how long it takes, 50 years like Myanmar, five years here and there, it all seems to lead to eventually peace making. That's the ultimate goal. Maybe not why people picked up arms. They 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 have. Uh, they have issues that they would like resolved. They have violations that they would like to stop. Um, and they pick up arms almost as a, uh, as, as, as one step towards resolving this. But eventually, regardless of whether pe people arms are picked up in various countries, my own country is one of them uh, in Kenya, where people sometimes feel we need to pick up arms to resolve this issue. But ultimately, it is that people want to sit at a table and discuss this is what we feel is wrong with this country, with this regime, uh, with this uh, discrimination of minorities. So it's a very, I love that question because is, it, is there a way for us to skip that 
all aspects of it and maybe put down our egos and put down our uh, feeling win-win scenarios that sometimes we have in our brains uh, and really remember that what we want is this mindfulness of reaching out to each other and that we don't want to set up structures and systems to discriminate against people because of race, because of ethnicity, because of which part of the country they're being from, from because of gender. Most human beings do not want that. And yet sometimes we find ourselves being caught up in that because the drums of war, thanks Jack, I like you said, they've started being beaten and we forget what was our ultimate goal. So yes, the, uh, the, the idea of look, moving a step forward to see how could we get to where if there are communities uh, feeling discriminated against, feeling disenfranchised, how could we start addressing that always without feeling like they've won because we gave up, because eventually we'll end up on a negotiating table and we will see how we can best compromise, how we can best take care of each other. And seven years ago, we had an assessment team in Ukraine working with uh, some potential local partners and developed with them, especially a uh, approach to the Donbas region. And as I see what's happening now, I, I just feel so sick that we were never able to interest anyone in funding that. That was seven years ago. I, I think that really for our work to be effective, we have to be there early on and build relationships and work with local populations. I think we maybe have seen a very different situation today if we would have been able to work there for the last seven years. But groups like the European Union I did not want to fund this. And now, we see how quickly NATO uh, can mobilize troops, how the US can move uh, 8,000 troops, how Russia can move 140,000 troops. And I think that we still say, give us the money to recruit, train, and move 5,000 unarmed civilian protection workers. And I know David Hartzell has been talking with some people about this very thing, that we could make much more of a difference than the NATO troops that are there or the Russian troops working hand in hand with the Ukrainian people who today are uh, grasping hands in unity. So it's, it's never too late. Um, we have a, a question from Candy, uh, Candy Miller, who um, asked, and I think this uh, relates back to something you said, Jack, about seeing every, everyone as victims seems to be a, a form of, of deficit framing uh, rather than asset framing. And yes, we've all been victimized, but isn't there more than that, that we all have loving souls and seeing um, the situation from that standpoint? I love the question. And of course, the answer is yes. And one of the beautiful answers is yes and yes, um, that I think both are needed. And, you know, in the US, there's actually a public monument on 4th Street in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, to the contemplative Thomas Merton's mystical experience. I think it's the only government sanctioned mystical experience uh, <laughs> recognition that I know of in the US when he came out of the monastery trying to be a holy person. And he said, I was walking down the street and suddenly I could see the secret beauty behind the eyes of everyone walking by. The, the one that each is in the eyes of the holy ones, that, that amazing spirit that was born. He said, and I was searching for it everywhere else. Um, so absolutely to be able to see in that way, to see the potential and that, that uh, as Rosemary was saying, we're longing for peace, we're longing for dignity and recognition, we're longing for the ability to manifest our life and um, compassion is absolutely critical because human incarnation is 
also really painful. This is the first noble truth of the Buddha, that there is suffering, there's loss, there's sickness, there's aging, there's conflict. All of these make up our human life. Um, and to see that in the life of everyone else melts the heart and you go, oh yes, we are in this together. We're in the beauty. I see who you really are, that amazing spirit, you know, and your potential. And I also see your measure of tears, your measure of struggle that every human being carries. And to be able to see, it's almost like being able to see with both eyes, with the tenderness of heart of compassion and the secret beauty that Thomas Merton speaks of. And this is part of what mindfulness allows us, what mindful loving awareness trains us to do, to be present in a gracious way for the suffering and hold it, not out of fear and not out of conflict, but to say yes. And then to say, and this is not the end of the story. That's only the first noble truth. You know, there are causes, greed, hatred, ignorance. And we know that there's an end, that there's peace that's possible with our loving heart and wise attention. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Rosemary, Mary Woods, uh, is wondering uh, the challenges about the challenges that you've experienced uh, and especially those challenges to your principles in the field and how you've addressed that. Um, I, I, will, I love that uh, Mary says about addressing, not resolving because it's a continuous process. Uh, one of my uh, challenge that uh, I'm constantly working through is primacy of local actors. Whom do I mean by that? It is very tempting as, a mem as nonviolent peace force to look for uh, a local NGO where they at least speak some level of English. Uh, so that you can communicate about the principles and they seem to understand what is happening in different parts of Myanmar. Um, and it appears that they, they, could, um, they could help us put in a programming and they have relatively good finance and reporting templates. Um, and I find this is the one I struggle with a lot because the, whom, whom do I mean? Who is it that would best uh, benefit from knowing about unarmed civilian protection? Uh, sometimes the person who would benefit most uh, about for that is uh, uh, is in a village somewhere that I don't have travel authorization to go to, uh, that I would then have to get a lot of approval from various many people to go, um, and it's it's a lot more work from my end to reach that particular individual who would like to know how can they can best protect themselves. And I have to constantly keep reminding myself that I don't do an armed civilian protection just for the sake of it. That at the end of it all, somebody hopefully feels a little bit safer uh, by the end of my interaction with them. Um, and I'm constantly challenging myself in making sure trying to get to that person who will directly benefit. I'm not saying I make it, but I challenge myself. And sometimes um, I do feel that it's always easier to start off with people who you're kind of speaking the same language, who almost seem to understand. They're already working in peace building. Uh, it is more challenging to work with people who do not believe that nonviolence works. <laughs> and yet they need protection and they need to feel safer and they need to feel they, they are part of the narrative in Myanmar. It's harder for me to have a conversation with them. And therefore I keep on reminding myself that they are the primary actors, not Rosemary, uh, not somebody else. So that's one principle I struggle with continuously and I work with, and I hope one day to take a a big step rather than a baby step towards that. <laughs> well, thank you, Rosemary, and thank you, Jack. Uh, we have a lot more questions and my inclination is to keep the uh, 
question and answers going and uh, we uh, committed uh, for an hour session and then the 15 minute meditation. So what I can say is that the questions that you have submitted, uh, as long as make sure that we have your email, that we will answer them uh, as best as we can. And uh, in, the, in the meantime, there are 125 of us from various parts of the world. We had people from Europe, we had people from Africa, we had people from Asia, we had people from North America, we had people from South America on this call. We can and will make the changes that are necessary. We have everything we need within us in the here and the now. So I thank you for sharing the here and now uh, with us. And I also would like to ask those of you who are able, if you uh, would donate, I, uh, there is a donate button. Claire, uh, I, I don't see it. Um, it, Jill, is it there? Okay, so, you know, we survive on, on the hopes, the aspirations, the courage, the prayers, and the money of thousands of people. Thousands and thousands of people have put forth, whether it be uh, 200 South Sudanese shillings or 2,000 US dollars. Each one of those contributions is as important as the next. And we need those contributions now. As you've seen from the questions that have emerged today, that there is so much work for us to do and we will continue. It's, it, it's too late to put the toothpaste back in the tube. We will continue to do this work. And also, I want to note that there are more and more organizations, now at least 50 that we have counted, that do some form of unarmed civilian protection in 26 areas around the world. This is growing. And we would appreciate that you continue to help us grow Nonviolent Peace Force. And so if you would donate uh, what you can either with the button today or uh, go on our website later, or even we even get mail, uh, believe it or not, you can send us a check. So I thank everybody. Uh, Jack, thank you. Rosemary, uh, Jilda, thank you for organizing this. Claire for doing the tech behind it. And for all of you who have shared this time with us. And I invite everyone now to stay and Jack will lead those of us who stay uh, in a 15 minute, 15 minute meditation. And then at the end, uh, we will just close. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. Um, and deep bows of respect to all those who are supporters and continue to be supporters of this work. And then to all those who are directly involved, the, the staff and the founders and all of the community of people that have been trained by Nonviolent Peace Force that are in the world that we support with our vision and our hearts and our understanding. So let us do some meditation practice since we've talked about mindfulness and mindful loving awareness. If you would, if you're able to put your things down and feel yourself settling and seated here on the earth and let your eyes close gently if you're comfortable doing so or lower your gaze. And feel in the seat that you are, how the earth completely supports you. That you can let go and feel the support of mother earth you, you take your seat halfway between heaven and earth in this remarkable human form and pause and quiet and listen with the heart.
and take two long breaths to release whatever wants to be let go of. Come more just here and now. Let the body relax a bit. Let the eyes and face be soft. Loosen the jaw. Relax the shoulders and let the arms and hands rest easily. Let the belly be soft and the breath natural. And let the heart be soft to receive whatever arises with a spirit of kindness, compassion. For just as we contend to others as an unarmed protection, let us turn this on our protection to ourselves. And feel how your body breathes itself now. Bring a loving awareness and notice the in and out of the breath and the nostrils or the rise and fall of chest or belly. And if it's hard to feel, just put your hand on your belly. Feel the rise and fall. And with each breath in and out or rise and fall, let yourself whisper, ease, calm. Invite a sense of peace amidst it all. Those are the words of Thich Nhat Hanh. Recite calm and ease as you breathe, he would say. And let the breath breathe itself, short or long, however it wants. You are the loving witness of this life breath, breathing in and out with the trees and the beings of life and the atmosphere surrounding this earth. Now bring the attention, the loving awareness to the whole field of your body. The field of sensations that you experience, areas of tension and tightness and ease, hot and cold, places of pain or pleasure. Sense the whole of your body with the same loving attention. And bring in a tenderness of compassion for all your body carries. Feel the places that want healing or care. As if you could bow to them, acknowledge with compassion how much you carry. Thank you. 
to the shoulders, to the arms, to the places of tension and pain, struggle. Thank you for caring so much. Holding with compassion. Thank you. You can relax now, I'm okay just now in this moment. You can relax. And invite a deepening sense of ease in the body. Wrapping this human body with compassion. And gratitude, thank you for caring so much. You can relax, I'm okay, just here, just now. Now bring the same loving awareness to your heart, to all the feelings and emotions you carry, longings and love, fear and anger, hurt or betrayal, excitement. all the emotions, the grief and tears that the heart carries, the beautiful care and tenderness. Oh, as if you could bow to your heart, wrap it in compassion, kindness. <sighs> Thank you for caring so much, dear heart. And feel what emotion just now really wants your attention. And let it speak, let it open, let it be received with loving awareness. And becoming the field of loving awareness, letting that emotion and all that the heart carries now be wrapped in compassion. <sighs> Life is hard for us, for those we love, for all the beings around us. Everyone has their struggles, some very deep. And wrap this heart in compassion and say, thank you. Thank you for carrying all of this. Thank you, dear heart. You can relax. I'm okay just now. Let your heart rest and be at ease. Let the breath deepen and the heart soften. And you are the loving awareness holding it all. Now shift the attention, the loving awareness, the mindful loving awareness to your mind. All the thoughts, and plans and trying to figure things out, all the images and worries and memories and strategy and stories that it tells, it's so busy in circles. And you feel all the energy of the mind holding it all with compassion and loving awareness, the whole mind as it is. As you feel it all, 
you can say with gratitude, thank you. Feel the speed of mind, the worry, the plan, the trying to make it all, figure it all out. Say, thank you for trying to keep me safe. Thank you for trying to take care of me. I'm okay just now, right here. You can relax. You can rest for a moment. I'm okay just here. And feel the breath again and let the mind quiet. And you become Thich Nhat Hanh, you become the Buddha, you become Kuan Yin, the Bodhisattva of compassion, taking her seat in the center of the world. And notice that you have become the loving awareness. You were the witness to this body. This body is not you. You're the loving witness to this heart. These feelings are not you. You're the loving witness to this mind. The thoughts are not you. Who you are is loving awareness. And let this mindful, loving awareness now spread from you as a beacon. And with the formal practices of compassion and loving kindness, spread a care out from you to all you know, all you've met. May I be a center of peace and deep compassion for all of you. Feel a connection for all who fear for their safety. Everyone fears. Even the ones that are targeted as enemies. May all of your hearts be at peace. All of you, the most difficult ones and the easy ones. May the center of peace I find here and now extend and embrace you all with deep compassion. We are in life together, learning. All of you, everyone, may your hearts find peace, compassion and care. And may I, may I embody this and carry it and send it out as I move through this world amidst the joys and the sorrows. Oh, nobly born, this is who you are, who you really are. You are the awakened ones. You are the bodhisattva of compassion. The great heart of compassion was born in you. Trust it. Rest in loving awareness and peace. And carry this wherever you go. Thank you. When you're ready, lay your eyes open again, carrying this, the perfume of your own peaceful heart. And thank you for this gathering and for all the amazing work of Nonviolent Peace Force and all of you who are part of the family and community and support. Thank you, Mel. If you want to unmute and say goodbye to each other, please do. If they can, can we unmute them, Gilda? We can try. I don't know who's the host. Let's see, I'm. It's I'm Claire. Able to unmute myself. Okay, then everyone can. Great. Goodbye, everyone.
Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone.